Good afternoon, Savannah! Good afternoon, Savannah! What a beautiful day it is in Georgia's most beautiful city. Wouldn't you agree? In Georgia's mother city. In a place that made history not too long ago. And in a place that we're going to make history again. Welcome to a place that helped change the trajectory, not only for the state of Georgia, but for the entire United States of America. Welcome to a place that made the Senate look more like America. Welcome to a place that help gives the Senate a soul. Welcome to a place that less than a block and a half was the raising place of the junior senator from the state of Georgia, Senator Raphael Warnock. And we're excited because he has done everything that he said he was going to do. He did not forget what he promised. He did not forget those who needed insulin. Anybody? He did not forget about pushing for voting rights. He did not forget Georgia. And he certainly has not forgotten Savannah. Ladies and gentlemen, we take nothing for granted around here. Nothing. We recognize that each win, each victory for our community has to continue to be fought for, has to continue to be sought out. And that is why we're asking for you to do what you've done before and to do it in a larger way and to do it again. We are asking you to be able to turn out in a big way. We're asking for Savannah and Chatham County to overperform, overperform, overperform as we have done before. We're asking for you to go to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family members, to remind them that as it is, that voting is still the fundamental way to have your voices heard. We're asking you to keep fighting the good fight. We're asking you to ignore the noise, to remain focused on the goal. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your aims up high. And let's let the mess remain low. And I'm asking you, and I don't know if he's ready, yeah, nah. Yeah, nah, yeah, nah, 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 yeah. All right. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> we we remind we re, we are reminded that the last day to register to vote is October the 11th. And so we need to make sure that we are registering folks to vote. And in many cases those of us that are just as impacted or just as involved can vote. They can vote. So let's make sure that we're out there. October 17th, we know is the day, the first day to vote early. And we don't want you to wait until election day to vote. Because we know the rules have changed about how we vote. We're not going to wait till the last minute because we recognize this is an election season. And so we want you to make sure that on November 4th, on the last day to vote early, that on November 8th, there is no doubt. Everybody turn your name and say, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. That we finish what we started and we give a six-year term 
to our Senator Savannah's own Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock. Make some noise for him. whose consequences would reach from one generation to the next. That feels like not long ago, let me tell you, you're not alone. <laughs> Matter of fact, the other day I was leaving the house, my two little children running around here somewhere, but I was leaving the house and um, I've got a, uh, Six-year-old, yeah, y'all sit down if you got a chair. I've got a six-year-old. Sound like Obama. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a Baptist preacher, so, you know, this might be a little while. I was leaving the house the other day, and I've got a six-year-old daughter and a three-and-a-half-year-old son, and my daughter said, Daddy, where you going? You know, she runs the toll bridge in my house. I have to have her permission. I said, I'm going out to campaign. She said, for what? I said, for Senate. She said, didn't we just elect you? <laughs> so I got a feeling that some of you might feel like Chloe. Didn't we just elect him? Well, I've got a question for you, Savannah. Are you ready to do it again? I'm so very proud to be a son of Savannah, Georgia. And as I look out and see these children coming home from school, it reminds me of the fact that it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but I guess it was a while ago. <laughs> that I was a kid growing up right here in Caton Homes. They called it the red brick. A kid growing up here in the 1980s. That era of high top fades. Believe it or not, I had one. And double dutch. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. And boom boxes. <laughs> and pounding out of those boom boxes the music of our experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Grandmaster Flash, don't push me because oh, I'm close yeah. to the edge. Yeah. I'm trying not to lose my head. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. <laughs> she knows it. But I had a mother and a father who poured so much in me. My family was short on money but long on love and long on faith. And we had a sense of humor. My dad was a preacher man and a junk man. During the week, he'd pick up old junk cars, load them on the back of a truck, took them over there to Chatham Steel, and that's how he took care of his family. 
But on Sunday morning, the junk man took off of his took off his work clothes, put on his Sunday morning clothes. And the man who spent all week lifting up broken cars on Sunday morning, he lifted broken people and convinced them that they were children of the living God, that there is treasure in what the rest of the world calls trash. And he poured those ethics into me and that sense of values. And, and although my, my dad can only dream of the things that I'm, I'm doing right now, God bless his memory, I feel like I'm still trying to stand tall enough to stand shoulder to shoulder to him because he was an ordinary man hard working man who worked with his hands that's why I stand up for workers all across this state folks who are the blood sweat and tears of what makes America a great country and during the pandemic we call those folks essential workers well if they are essential workers somebody ought to pay them an essential wage give them essential benefits My parents poured so much into me. Told you about my dad, but my mom was a kid who grew up in the 1950s in Waycross, Georgia. You know where that is. It's way. I mean, way across Georgia. She grew up in the 1950s like a lot of black teenagers picking somebody else's cotton and somebody else's tobacco. But because this is America, the octogenarian hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton and pick somebody else's tobacco picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. Only in America is my story possible, and that's why I'm running for re-election, because I believe in America. I believe in Georgia. I believe in us, and I know that when we stand together, the whole state is better. Are you ready to stand together and win this election one more time? I mean, are you ready to knock on some doors? Are you ready to text your friends and your neighbors? Are you ready to turn up on October 17 because there's so much at stake? Are you ready to win this election? So, we got to make this happen, y'all. And I believe that we will. You did an amazing thing. Georgia did an amazing thing. At a moment when there were folk trying to divide us, stirring up the ugly side of our complicated American family story. Because the truth is, all families have a complicated story. I know that I'm a pastor. You know, they show up on Sunday morning about 10 minutes after church starts so they can walk down the aisle and everybody can see what a beautiful family they are. <laughs> they look so perfect. But just beneath the surface, all families have a complicated story. The American family has a complicated story and there, are folks, there were folks who were trying to stir up that, that ugly and complicated side. But Georgia did an amazing thing. It sent its first African-American senator and its first Jewish senator to the United States Senate in one fell swoop. And I believe that in glory somewhere, Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel were giving each other a high five. Because when they marched, they marched together. Rabbi Heschel said that when he marched alongside Dr. King, he felt like his legs were praying. And so tell your friends and your neighbors that that's what we've got to do, especially tell the people of faith that we've got to pray, not just with your lips. You've got to pray with your legs. You've got to translate your faith and your values into action. You've got to show up and vote like your life depends on it because it actually does. Because of what you did. 
We passed the single largest tax cut for middle and working class families in American history. Because of what you did, we passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which brings resources to Georgia for our bridges, for our roads, for broadband. We, we so badly needed to do infrastructure. And can I tell you, I believe in infrastructure. Now, this is what happens when you send a pastor to the Senate. I even think infrastructure is spiritual. I do. Now, what do you mean it's spiritual? It's bricks and more. I, I think infrastructure is spiritual. Hear me out. If, if, you went, if you went to a family's home and they were people you knew and you happened to know without beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have money, they have resources. I'm not talking about a poor family, a family that has resources. And you were to go to their house, Scott, and the roof was caving in. And rain was pouring into the living room and everybody was sitting there like nothing was happening. Nobody even got up to move. And the pipes were in bad shape and rusted water was coming through the pipes. And the kitchen was a mess. And the grass looked like it hadn't been cut in a long time. And the fence was falling down. If you went to a house like that and the people in that house have resources and they didn't even fix their house, you wouldn't simply say that that house needs fixing. You'd say those people need fixing. Like how is it that they're sitting in their own house and they can't somehow find the wherewithal to fix the house that they live in together? That's why I think infrastructure is spiritual. It's about more than bricks and mortar. Don't you know that our broken streets and our broken bridges and our broken public schools are a reflection of the brokenness in our politics, a brokenness in the American spirit? And so there's no easy cure-all for all of our problems. I'm not going to tell you that. These, 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 these fights have been around a long time. But part of what we need to do is dream big together and remind each other that we actually live in the same house. It's an American house. It is the house where all of our children live. And at the end of the day, each of us makes about the same promises to our children. And politics, public policy, ought to be about helping people to keep the promises that they make to their children. And so an, an amazing thing happened when we were passing the bipartisan infrastructure bill. It's called the Warnock Cruise Amendment. Yeah. I didn't go on a cruise, Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz and I did an amendment together. Yes, we did. Now, I will admit to you that Ted Cruz and I are both on the Commerce Committee. We don't agree on much. Much of the time he's talking. I'm wondering how in the world can you think like that? I'm sitting here thinking to myself, now I know why I got up and got dressed. But you mean you put on a tie to come here to do that? <laughs> but one day, Senator Cruz wanted to get something done, and guess what? The thing he wanted to get done, I also wanted to get done. We couldn't get it done in committee, so we had to take it to the floor of the Senate the night the bipartisan infrastructure bill was passed. And he stood on his side of the aisle, and he made his argument about why he thought we should do this thing. And I stood on my side of the aisle, and I also made my argument about why I also thought we should do this thing. And then I close with words I never imagined hearing myself say. I can't deny them because they're on tape. I said something like, Mr. President, in closing, I agree with and I'd like to associate myself with the words of the, t the senator from Texas. Our colleagues stood there in disbelief. They looked at him, looked at me. 
looked at him, looked at me, and they passed it unanimously. Now, I'm not so sure that all of them knew what was even in the amendment. I got a feeling they said, if he's for it and he's for it, that's got to be a decent deal. We'll let it pass. They passed it. Some might wonder, what in the world could Raphael Warnock and Ted Cruz be working on together? It's actually very simple. It's not complicated at all. There is a road that runs through Texas. It's about 25 miles long right now. Ted Cruz wants to build it out. He wants to build Interstate 14, I-14, Interstate 14. Because it's the interstate, Interstate 14 doesn't stop at the Texas border. The same road that goes through Texas also goes through Georgia. And so I, I didn't mind connecting with him because I want I-14 built out also because it goes right through the heart of our state. It connects our military bases. It would revitalize a lot of these communities that are in economic distress. And so I hooked, with him, hooked up with him to build I-14 out, at least to name it a priority corridor so we'd be one step closer to actually getting it done. There is a road that runs through our humanity that is bigger than partisan politics, that is bigger than regional differences. There is a road that runs through our humanity that's more important than color, more important than tribalism, more important than all of these ways that are trying to separate us. There is a road that runs through the center of our humanity, and our job is to find a way to build that road out. Because if we build out the road, Workers can get on the road. If we build out the road, students can get on the road. If we build out the road, parents who are trying to find a way for their children can build out the road. I say let's build the road. Build it wide and build it long so that all of God's children can get to where they're trying to go. <laughs> Infrastructure is about the house we live in together. And if we won't fix the house, it's not just the house is broken. And so I'm glad we passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Broadband in that bill. Broadband is to the 21st century what electricity was in the 20th century. We gotta build it out. Because of what you did, we got it done. Because of what you did, we passed the Jobs and Competition Bill, which invests in domestic manufacturing, which will help Q-cells in Dalton, Georgia. Did you all know the largest domestic manufacturer of solar panels in the Western Hemisphere is in Dalton, Georgia? Did you all know that the most popular SUV in the country is built at a Kia plant in West Point, Georgia. And so we passed this bill to invest in domestic manufacturing because too many of the chips are being made other places other than the United States. That plant had to shut down a couple of times. Why? Because we're waiting on chips from other places. Why would we wait on chips from other places when we invented the chip? Those chips need to be made right here in Georgia, made right here in the United States of America. And we're one step closer because of what you did, because of what you did. We passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Historic investments in clean energy and clean energy jobs to get us ready for the future, to take seriously the climate change that you're feeling right now. <laughs> Aren't you glad we passed the Inflation Reduction Act? And in that piece of legislation, there are two provisions that I wrote. I want you to know I wrote them because I want you to understand how important your vote actually is and what it does. 
I wrote one provision in that bill, which was also a health care bill, that caps the cost of prescription drugs for our seniors. I met a woman named Gretchen Spring, who came to a field hearing that I held not long ago. And she was a widow, but she was talking to me about the last months of her husband's life. She was testifying and telling us how as he struggled with his disease, they were maxing out their credit cards, paying health care costs. I think about the folks I know who are just struggling, trying to pay the co cost of prescription drugs. And so I wrote that provision that caps the cost of prescription drugs because seniors shouldn't have to choose between buying medicine and buying groceries. But not only that, I wrote another provision in the same bill. And it caps the cost of insulin for folks who are on Medicare. Insulin should not be expensive. It's a drug that was invented 100 years ago. Patent sold for one dollar. Big pharmaceutical companies are price gouging insulin. And why are they able to do it? Because there are too many of my colleagues who think they work for the pharmaceutical companies rather than the people who sent them to the Congress. Savannah, I want you to know that I'm very clear. I work for you. I don't work for Big Pharma. I don't work for Big Oil and Gas. I work for you. And my dad told me if somebody hires you to do a job, do the job they hired you to do. And so we capped the cost of insulin. But folks were on Medicare, and I tried to do it for everybody because insulin should not be expensive. They blocked us. But if you send me back to the Senate, you have my word. I will keep fighting. I won't stop fighting until we get reasonably priced insulin for everybody. In that same bill, we did something else that's important. We gave Medicare the ability to negotiate the price of prescription drugs. So thank you, Savannah, Georgia. You did an amazing thing. My prayer is that you will do it again. I know that many of you are frustrated by the Supreme Court, an activist court bent on shaping the whole society in their narrow image. Women's reproductive rights are under attack. You've got a choice to make, Georgia, about who you think is ready to represent you in the United States Senate. I believe in a woman's right to choose. I was a man of faith. I have a profound reverence for life. That's why I fight for health care the way I do, because I have a profound reverence for life. And I also have a deep respect for choice. The question is, whose decision is it? That's the question. And I happen to think that a patient's room is too small and cramped a space for a woman her doctor and the United States government, that's too many people in the room. And if you really do believe in life, then why won't you say something about the high rates of infant mortality and maternal mortality in this country? Why aren't you offended by the fact that black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth or as a result of childbirth than their white sisters, even when they have the income and the insurance. But every now and then, God gives us a glimpse of what's possible. 
and her name is Katanji Brown Jackson. And the day we confirmed her to the court, the whole chamber was full. Let me tell you this, as I close, nobody believes a preacher when he says, as I close. <laughs> The day we confirmed Katanya Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court, the whole Senate chamber was full. And while we were waiting to vote, my colleague, Senator Cory Booker, and I were standing around near the chair of the presiding officer. And the vice president was sitting in the chair. And Senator Booker and I were talking to her and she said, guys, you know this is quite a historic moment, an amazing moment, powerful moment. She said, here's what you ought to do. You ought to take a moment and write a letter to somebody who comes to your mind in a moment like this. She suggested that the way black women make suggestions. <laughs> And then she reached into her portfolio and gave each of us a sheet of paper. <laughs> Didn't take me long to know who I wanted to write that letter to. I sat down and I wrote a letter to my own daughter. Thought about my own five-year-old daughter. And I said, dear Chloe, Today we confirm to the United States Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson, in the long history of our nation, she is the first Supreme Court justice who looks like you, with hair like yours. That's me talking to my daughter. While we were confirming her, a friend of mine, the Vice President, suggested that I write a letter. By the way, she's the first vice president who looks like you. I write this letter to say that in America, you can be and you can achieve anything you set your head and your heart to do. Love, Dad. I was so moved by the moment that I couldn't wait till I flew home. I, I, I wanted my daughter to hear that letter, so I, I called her on FaceTime. And I read the letter to my daughter. She listened. She was not impressed. <laughs> she said, can I go play now? She doesn't quite get it yet. But in due season, she will. I need you to show up on October 17th. And I'm saying that I need you to show up. And as I say that, I'm not saying that just as a senator. I'm not saying that just as a candidate. I'm not even just saying that as a pastor. I'm saying that to you as a dad. I need you to show up. Because I made a promise to my own daughter that in America, there was no cap on her dreams. And not just her dreams, but the dreams of all children that their parents' income does not have to determine their outcome. And so showing up is about helping dads and moms keep the promises that they make to all of their children in a real sense Legislation is a letter that we write to our future. The Apostle Paul talks about writing, he, he wrote a lot of letters. He called them epistles and he would write them to the church at Corinth and the church at Rome because he was trying to build a kind of community. And so I want you to know that what we do in this moment is a letter to the future. And you ought to ask yourself what your letter 
will say. I want my letter to say that I stood up in this defining moment in America. I want my letter to say that I stood up on behalf of all of us, red, yellow, brown, black, and white, on behalf of all of us, male and female, gay and straight, rich and poor. I want my letter to say that I stood up on behalf of that American covenant, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. I want my letter to say that I stood for workers so that they could have a livable wage, that I stood up for women so they could get equal pay for equal work. I want my letter to say that I showed up, that I knocked on doors, that I used my voice in order to build an America that all of us can be proud of. And are you ready? Yeah. Let's make this thing happen. Let's knock on doors. Yeah. Let's call your friends. Show up. Let your voice be heard until we win the future for all of our children. God bless you.